Uh, it's, it's funny because people think you just magically become a Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I feel like that's not really the way it works. <laughs> no, it's, it's not the way it works. You may know now Rogers' distinct sound. We are the hit he helped make. But long before he helped launch Madonna's career, or jammed with Pharrell and Daft Punk. She's up all night to the sun. I'm up all night to get some. She's up the legendary producer was a Black Panther. I just sort of, how would I say, I elevated or I developed into a Panther. So when I joined the Black Panther Party at 16 and a half years old, after having an entire youth of not only just activism when it was political, but also I was a Boy Scout and a Cub Scout, and I was just raised to help people. It was almost like a rite of passage. It was like you grew up into being a Panther. I was born in New York City, and I had, I would say, part of what we would call the movement for some time. As a teen, now was against the Vietnam War. And the fact that as soon as we became 18, especially people of color and poor people were instantly just shipped off to Vietnam. At this same time, the women's movement and Stonewall riots were also converging, which is why they called it the movement. The last thing that we want right now is it's any kind of violence. The Black Panther Party was some of the best education we ever got because they taught us how to run businesses. They taught us how to be responsible community organizers. What a lot of people don't understand is that the Panthers, they were run in very much in a similar way that the Navy runs a submarine. That you would take a person who was of the lowest rank, the newest person in the Panther, and you would give them a position that they used to call officer of the day and you would tell the person who didn't know much about business and running an office and being responsible, and everybody had to be subordinate to the office of the day. And that was this person's education. That was their training on how to be courteous to the people in the community, how when we were going to negotiate for the free goods that the, the, the grocers and the merchants would give us. And nobody knows about that. All they talk about is the guns up in Oakland. What Nile is referring to is the Mulford Act, a 1967 bill that repealed California's open carry laws, making it illegal to have loaded guns in public after Black Panther members would legally carry while patrolling Oakland neighborhoods. So that's why when the Black Panther Party formed and in Oakland, California, they could walk into the courthouse with guns. The same thing that white people were able to do as soon as black people did it, all of a sudden they, they made open carry illegal. And the police are there not to, uh, in our community, not to uh, promote our welfare or uh, for our security and our safety, but they're there to contain us, um, to uh, brutalize us and murder us. You see black people doing it, all of a sudden it's militant, oodlum, blah, blah, blah. The exact same shot just changed the color of the person and it has a different meaning. The meaning is exactly the same. People are just protesting it, asking for their rights that are written in our documents that founded this country. Real Panther life is painting a person's house, taking their laundry, getting groceries, feeding kids. That's real Panther life. That would be pretty boring to show on television. But boy, it sure was exciting to show people walking into the Oakland Alameda Courthouse. Mal continues to carry on his giving spirit through his We Are Family Foundation, started in 2002 in response to the September 11, 2001 attacks. The foundation's goal has been to amplify and support diverse young leaders who are attacking systemic racism through basic needs like food, water, and housing. I founded We Are Family Foundation, whose primary mission was anti-biasness. We quickly learned that focusing on basic human needs and our common humanity was our way of pursuing lasting peace. That you're filled with so much hope is incredible to me because legendary is not even the way to begin to describe you. 
and you've been through so much, you know, your, your background, your childhood, you are literally a living testament to what it is to overcome. And I just, I'm floored by that. And I think it, it, it's, it's enough to be said that that you can still have such a positive attitude is nothing short of amazing. I am really sitting, I'm sorry to talk over you, but yeah, I am only sitting here just because of the number of encounters I've had. The police just didn't choose to shoot. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. They just chose not to shoot. I cannot tell you how many countless situations I was in. Just a few months ago, Niall says he was driving to Vermont to work with a well-known band. And the next thing I know, I was driving and driving and driving, and the road signs started to come up in French. And I was like, whoa, I'm near the French-Canadian border. What happened? How did I miss that? So I turn off because now I'm running out of gas. I turn off. I go to the little convenience store, and as soon as I walk in, there's a sole white woman at this store. She pushes the panic button, unbeknownst to me. I don't even have any contact with her. I go right in because my car is outside filling up automatically. I go directly to the refrigerated bin to decide whether I want Diet Mountain Dew, which I knew had the most caffeine, or whatever, while my car is filling up. Next thing I know, two officers walk in and they're screaming. So I look to the left to see who they were possibly talking to. Now, if you had just seen the camera and they shot me, they would have said, oh, he was looking for a way to run out of the store. But in fact, all it was that this cacophonous thing that was happening at the door, I tried to see who they were talking to because it certainly couldn't have been me. One, I have a car that you could spot a mile away. My friends laugh and call it the Bumblebee Mobile. This yellow Range Rover is only a hundred in the world. I looked at them and they could see I was puzzled. And I think that maybe my sense of puzzlement startled them because they're probably accustomed to dealing, I don't know what that, I can't read their minds at all. But all I know is that it's at some point, the situation calmed down. I started talking to the officers. During your training, is there any type of training that's like a sort of a logic kind of course? Like when you come to a crime scene, is your brain processed to look around and look at your surroundings? Like did, did, didn't you notice that the car was a $100,000 car? Didn't you notice that it was being filled up? Didn't, didn't you, I mean, when you get to a crime scene, don't you start to go, okay, I got this fact, that's a fact, this a fact, that's a fact, that's a fact. Anyway, they were so embarrassed by the time I finished my little diatribe, they actually gave me a police escort all the way to the place where I was going to Vermont, to the border, and wow. said, okay, now it's just two miles down. And then they gave me, I don't know, some kind of get out of jail free card, like, please don't stop this guy, or if you stop him, officer so-and-so said this. Wow. Like, ah! After a while, I remember saying one day when I was driving down the street with Madonna, and I was hassled like you couldn't believe. I just said, you know what? It's more trouble than it's worth. So now I drive around the cheap little, I'm not dissing signs, but I drive around the car and it's like so cheap you can't believe it. Matter of fact, uh, an officer stopped me a few months ago and he said, man, you're not Roger. What are you doing driving a car like this? I was like, you know, brother, <laughs> do I really have to explain it to you? You know, you don't want to hear that story of what happened to me and my four friends on our way to Woodside. It was horrible. I do want to hear that story. What happened? We were hitchhiking because we were kids. Hitchhiking was a normal thing. Cop pulled a gun out on us, lined us up in a ditch, right? There was a drainage ditch off the side of the road. And the cop told us that he was going to go up two miles, swing around and come back. And if he saw us, he was going to put a bullet in each of our heads. We would just drop in the ditch. And he says, and nobody would even care. <laughs> we knew he was telling the truth. When the president has a rally and can't even get 7,000 people. And meanwhile, you have a little town like where I live up in Connecticut. And all of a sudden you see 7,000 people show up in a little town that's predominantly white. And they're laying on the roadway and they're out there and you go, whoa. 
what going on? This is a movement. This is powerful. This is not fly by night. This is not what we used to call in the Panthers armchair revolutionaries, weekend revolutionaries. These kids are serious, dedicated, and their hearts are in it, and they're filled with love. Niall knows the younger generations are going to be the ones to affect true change. I think it's a long road to hope, but I honestly feel very inspired. And I think that this is a movement of love and compassion. And I heard someone say that love will always win. Well, I'm an old school hippie. I believe that all day long. So <laughs> <I know. laughs> for Inside Edition Digital, I'm Stephanie Officer.